Jaron. If you can find Matthew 24, 15, I want to to point something out to you. Is that on there or not? I know I changed it from Matthew 24, 21. You may have to just find 24, 15 in your Bibles. I just want to talk about that just for a second. Um, You know, I have been, Matthew 24, 15, just in case. Did you see that one? I took it off, so it's probably not there. I took it off uh, last week. Um, So you guys might have to resort to looking in your scriptures. 24.15 Therefore Oh, he found it. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation of, spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Jesus just told him uh, the current temple is to be destroyed. So this says a great deal for more than what's on the surface. Um, I want to just address this just uh, uh, just to, for a moment. And, and I know, and I apologize if, if this is too teaching for anybody, but um, I tend to, when we're going through the book of Revelation, I want to be sure that we um, that we approach it um, it, you know as, I don't want to say clinically as possible Um, I know that a lot of times that that's not as much fun for people uh, when we get information rather than um, maybe being preached at or uh, or entertain, and there's a lot of churches today that are growing very rapidly um, <clears throat> by by the personage of it, the individual. He's able to, you know, mesmerize the people with his with his preaching and his encouragement, and and that's fine, you know, that that's where they're going. But I believe when we go to Revelation, we can't do that. I think we have to take it very methodically. We have to be very careful of what we look at and don't look at, and. Uh, when I say look at look at the word, don't look at some of the things that the world is trying to say about what's going to happen. But um, <clears throat> Matthew twenty four fifteen, he says he says watch for the abomination of desolation. Now, what I've talked to you about is is the, the traditional s- scenarios of pre trib, post trib, mid trib. Let me try again. I'll, I'll go through it more logically. Um, pre-trib, <clears throat> mid-trib, pre-wrath, and post-trib. Now, pre-trib says Christ is going to come back for us uh, at any time prior to uh, the 70th week of Daniel, uh, which the, when you're pre-trib, you consider the whole 70 weeks the tribulation. It's never called that. Only the last three and a half years are actually called the great tribulation, <clears throat> and it's the wrath of God. It's apparent by the, the changing of the signs of the moon and the sun darkened, and things that are out of the control of, of our earth and our sin in the earth. A lot of, <clears throat> you know, when things like Katrina happened, and I know this is years ago, but when things like that happened, a lot of uh, evangelists and, and TV ministries came out and said, oh, this is the wrath of God striking down, you know, because of the sin that's there. And um, and you know if he if he's if he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah then he you know America deserves at least that and um, but but that's not the plan we're we're under a new covenant and God doesn't do that but our sin does where where our sin is the earth cries out we actually affect the earth we were given dominion over the earth we gave it away to Satan. The church has taken it back through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we're once again in control um, of, of the elements of this earth. We don't typically, the church doesn't teach that, so typically people don't move in that area. But um, but we're what is impacting the earth today, and it says in Romans 8 that the earth cries out in agony, just waiting for this time to, to end and for Christ to return and rule and reign in perfection for a thousand years. And, and so the things that are happening in the world get increasingly, increasingly uh, uh, cataclysmic as the sin, as the boldness of sin arises. Like I said, I don't watch much TV, and I was just, I was just actually offended. I, I don't want to do it. You know, we're old people, 
Eagles, we watch, you know, the spin the, what is that called? Um, Wheel of Fortune, thank you. Uh, we watch we watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, and that's about it. Um, and and I was so upset the other day. They have I, the, the media is so pushing this. The other day they had three contestants, one normie as I'll call him, just a normal young woman. Um, then another guy was an opera singer, and you could tell he was very infeminate. And uh, I just this place that, you know, some people, unfortunately, have been raised in that environment and um, maybe without a father in the home or whatever, and, and they tend to be that way. And then uh, the third was a, a woman, and she happened to be a woman of color, and she talked about her wonderful family and her six kids and her wife. And um, so, you know, and I was like, why did they have to do that? Well, she didn't win. The guy won. And he, they said, who's in the audience here with you? And he says, well, my father, who's just wonderful, you know, he talked about his father, and um, and my better half, he said, my better half. And sitting next to his father was a woman that was obviously younger than the father, but maybe a little older than the guy that was the contestant. And um, and another guy, you know, kind of a balding guy was sitting next to him in kind of a sweatshirt kind of a thing. And, and he said, my better half, well, you assume that the, the lady sitting with the young child, about a 12-year-old daughter, you, you kind of just assumed that that was his better half. Well, that wasn't his better half. The guy in the gray sweatshirt was his better half. He came up and hugged him and kissed him and everything. And I'm saying, why? Why is this going on? But sin is becoming so bold. It's becoming so bold. I mean, the media covered the women's walk. They covered the women's walk thing, you know, the, the protest against... Uh, really against Trump is what it was, but they covered that in Washington and, and the whole thing. And then they had the pro-life thing, the women's pro-life thing, and which our Vice President Pence spoke to them. And and which one gets all the news? The the radical protesting, you know, it was just terrible. And the and the, the walk for life got very little press, just very little mention in the news. And <clears throat> I don't have cable, so I can't see what the cable news stations are saying. And, and I'm just getting, so I can't even hardly watch the news anymore because they're so they're so uh, biased and everything. And, and what's happening is sin is getting bold on this earth. And we think of it, it, America because we live in America and we see it. But, you know, the, the European countries are way past this, or way past this. When I was working for, uh, for Control Data and we are developing the disk for your C drives, I had an engineer, Bob Griffith, was, I, had, I had assigned him to, uh, he'd been assigned to uh, Europe to work with Philips to develop what you now call the your DVD or CD. They didn't exist at that time. And uh, he was over there working with Philips. And, and he would contact me, he'd email me. We didn't have email in those days, but it was, we had something similar to that electronically. And he'd send me tapes. You know, he'd record tapes and send me his status and tell me what's going on and all that. And I had just had the fortune to really uh, bring him to the Lord. And, and he had had a background in, in church, but I was able to, before he went on to, to work in, in Holland for a couple of years, that uh, I was able to really. And so he was sending me a lot of things. And, and he was just so disturbed because he had a 13-year-old daughter that took him over there. I almost felt bad for him, uh, sending him over there because... He said his 13-year-old daughter was getting such horrible indoctrination. And this is, what is this, 1985? This is a long time ago. He said it was so filthy and the prostitutes and everything were so bold and, and, and the gay lifestyle was so bold over there. This has been going on in Europe and now it's working its way here because the church has, has kind of let things go. We only pretty much see it as it influences America. But when, when whole nations of ISIS-type people are emboldened to, to strike out and, and just murder, mass murder people and, you know, in Syria and in and, and, and these countries. It, it's just, th this is getting terrible. This is getting terrible. And, and it's, we're starting to experience it here. And um, that's, <clears throat> that means we're getting closer to Christ's return because these, these may be the birth pangs that he's describing where the earth just begins to, the earth just becomes sick becomes sick, like it wants to just vomit up the, the impacts of sin.
that man has created on the earth. But the post-trip people think that we will, <clears throat> that the first three and a half years is included in the quote-unquote tribulation, and so we would be gone before that because it says we're not to suffer the wrath of God. But, but really, specifically, the Bible talks about the wrath of God coming after the midpoint. So that's why you have mid-trip people, that they believe that, that, that the first three and a half years can actually be very deceptive. Some people think the first three and a half years will be years of great worldwide prosperity. And everybody will be saying, wow, this is great. You know, this is just, this is great. You know, everything's turning around and everything's happening. And you look at that and you say, can that really happen in a, in a world that's so torn and divided? And I'm not going to suggest that our president is the Antichrist by any means. But how quickly, how quickly has he been able to move to make people come together? I mean, he's got the Japanese coming here. He's talking to the Chinese. And, and you know, everybody's responding. Even Putin says it's nice to at least have somebody you can respect in the office now. And so the whole world is, is in, it, and you can begin to see, wow, if the right guy comes along, the right person comes along, the whole world, the whole world is going to be coalesced under this person. And, and it, the fact that he's just doing this stuff just begins. Now, there's protesters, obviously, there's people that are resisting that. But by and large, he's moving so quickly to bring, to bring the... To, to bring all these these companies back, that all these big manufacturers are talking about moving their factories back into the country and they're making announcements. And it's happening so fast. It, and it's like, how can this happen so fast? How can something like this turn around so quickly? And it's just indicative of the fact that in the last days, it, somebody's going to come and bring this stuff all together. And, and the same thing, you know, it, it sounds funny when I say this, but even the climate change people, they kind of have something right. They think man is influencing the, the atmosphere of the world and that we need to stop using gas and all that kind of stuff. And they're trying to say we're causing global warming and all that kind of thing. But it's not our use of hydrocarbons that's causing this to happen. It's our sin. It's the sin of the world. The earth is disgusting. The earth was never designed to be under this kind of disgusting behavior. And... And as the earth becomes disgusting, we're going to see global change. And, and the Bible tells us that it's going to be global change. And the climate change people are trying to blame us, blame the, the, the people that are, you know, the, that are using the fuels and all this, the fossil fuels as they call them. And, um, and in reality, it, 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 it is us, but it's not how we use the energy that God gave us to, to operate this planet with. It's, it's the way the sin is, is abounding and it's, it's causing. But the, the good thing is the scriptures say when sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So, so God's grace is ready and loaded. The, you know, the, the, the gun of salvation, if you want to call it a gun, it's loaded. It's cocked and loaded. And, but, but we're the ammunition. Are we going to go forth? And are we going to go forth and take the grace of God? As sin abounds, grace abounds. But the grace has to abound as us as instruments of God reaching out to the world. So the mid-trip people think possibly the first three and a half years will actually be uh, a, a certain form of prosperity. That they'll be crying peace, peace, and and um, and people are going to be people are going to be changed, and uh, they, and the world's going to be changed, and they're going to see this leader. This leader is going to come on the scene, and he's going to establish some some sort of a covenant or contract with with Israel and, and their enemies that surround them. And when that contract begins, then then the seven years of the 70th week of uh, Daniel begin. Now, I'm careful to call it the 70th week of Daniel instead of the tribulation. All the movies that we've seen, you know, the, the you know, Left Behind movies and all those books and series have indicated that that the, this, the, the rapture happens and then then uh, and, and then the seven years begin, um, but in reality, seven years could begin at any point in time, because it's not the tribulation. The first three and a half years is not the tribulation. It's never called the tribulation in the Bible. But specifically, the second three and a half years is called the tribulation. And then the next group is the pre-wrath people, and the pre-wrath people. Um, they, they say that what happens is we go through Revelations chapter 6 down to the last uh, 
the last seal, and the last seal to be opened begins the wrath of God, and then the church is taken out, which is just after the mid-trip. Uh, the mid-trip problem, why it's never really been launched as very successful, is because it says we don't know the time, the day, or the hour. And if it actually, if the rapture was to happen in the mid-tribulation period, we would know the exact day and the hour because it would be three and a half years after the contract was signed in the beginning of the 70th year of the 70th week. So that, that's been the failing of the mid-trib is they say, well, you'll know the, you'd actually know the day and the hour because it would be three and a half years. It's very specific, 1260 days. It, it's, it's very specific about the three and a half years. So they say, well, it can't be mid-trib or you'd know. And then, and, and then you have the, the pre-wrath and that's, that's, well, we don't know when it's going to happen exactly because it doesn't happen at the three and a half year mark. It happens somewhere right after that, but it's like within months. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be very far into that, quote, second and a half of the three and a half years. And then you have the post-trip people. And I'm doing all this because I want, I want you to hear something in a second. We have the post-trip people are next. And the post-trip people say that, that if all this is going to happen the great tribulation is going to happen. The wrath of God is going to be poured out. And the church will actually be here then. And then just, just days before it's all over, we're taken up. And then we turn right around and come back with Jesus for the battle of Armageddon. And so that's, that's the post-trib people would say, we're going to go through the whole tribulation. We're going to go through the whole 70th week uh, of, uh, of Daniel. And then be taken out and turn right around and come back with, with Jesus. And, and all of these have, you know, great structured debates on them. Um, but the problem is, is the, the, the pre-trib, post-trib, and mid-trib can all be pretty much uh, uh, dealt with in the fact that there's very little scripture. The, the, one of the most favor, famous people uh, of the pre-trib uh, is, a, is a fellow named Walford, W-A-L-V-O-R-D. Uh, and he himself has said, he himself is said there is no there is no actual scriptural defense for pre-trib, and uh, he's a great scholar, written many books and, and a great theologian, and he's and, and he's pre-trib, but he said there's no scripture, but he says there's no scripture to support post-trib either, and um, and what we're trying to do is just walk through this step by step and let you figure out where this is going to happen for me for you. Um, because it, it, the, the object is, is to prepare us for the return of Christ. When Christ came the first time, the Jews knew the day and the hour. And that's why it said, we don't know the day and the hour now. They had a Jewish calendar that was kept by the Levites on a month-to-month -month basis. That calendar could change. It was all based on the moon. And, um, and they knew. That's why they hailed him when he came in on the riding on the donkey. That day they hailed him, what we call Palm Sunday. They hailed him and hallelujahed him because he was the Messiah. That was the exact day. He was doing all the miracles he was supposed to be doing. That was the exact day. The Pharisees didn't want it to be him because they wanted it to be the, the, the second part of Daniel where he comes riding in on a white horse and defeats Rome. They wanted that to be the Messiah, a, a Messiah of power to take back uh, Jerusalem from Rome. And, and he didn't. He didn't do that. He came as a suffering servant, which is very biblical and confounded scripturally. And, um, and the key is recognizing him in the Holy Spirit, being so full of the Holy Spirit, being so in relationship that you know your bridegroom when he comes. You know as time comes closer when he's going to come. And, uh, and so we, we will be prepared in our heart. Anna and Simeon knew him as an infant. They knew their Messiah had come. Because why? They had followed the scripture and they knew he was supposed to be born in that day. The, day, the lady that grabbed at his, the lady that grabbed at his, uh, that had the issue of blood and grabbed at his robe, the, the tassels on his robe, the base of his robe, she knew Ruth. She knew that, that Ruth had gone to Boaz's tent and she, she had met her kindred redeemer and he redeemed her. Boaz had redeemed her because he went in, she went into his tent at night and grabbed his, the, 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 the bottom of his robe, the tassels on his robe. And, and because of that, he married her, and she became the inheritor. And, and that's all, all that's representative of Christ's coming. And so that woman knew that she had an issue of blood, and if she could only touch the tassels, 
She didn't go to say, lay hands on me. She didn't try and get into the crowd to say, you know, touch me, Jesus. She knew that he was her kindred redeemer, and if she could just touch the tassels on his robe, she'd be healed. That's how they knew. They knew the scriptures. They knew when he was coming. That's why 3,000 people got saved the day after Acts, or the, or the day of, uh, of Acts 2, where the, the Holy Spirit came, and, and Peter went out there and presented the gospel. It's like, oh my gosh, no-brainer. We've known this all along. We missed him. We misunderstood who he was. But they knew the day and the hour. Now, when, when the temple was destroyed, the ability for the Levites to, to track the calendar went away. And they turned their calendar into the Arab calendar because the Rome's calendar was, a, was based on the revolutions around the sun, whereas the, the Jewish calendar was based on the rising and setting of the moon. And the only moon calendar that was available at that time was the Arabic moon calendar. And so they picked up the Arabic moon calendar and what they call today the, the, the Jewish calendar and all that, and they're still going from, from you know, we're 5,000, whatever it is, and, and that, that's all not based. It's not really a Jewish calendar. It's, it's so ironic. It's a, the, the Jews follow an Arabic calendar because the Arabic calendar goes by the actual rotations of the time of the moon and the setting and all that, where the Jewish calendar was all based on when the Levites would say, we've just had a full moon, we've just you know, had, a, had, a, had a, a, a waxing moon and all that kind of stuff. They, they were the ones that said, this is the day, and this is when it begins, and it's a calendar of 360 days instead of 365. So, and it had to be modified on a regular basis or they, they run into trouble. That's why we have February... 28th or 29th every four years. So it's uh, it's it's important to understand that. So we won't know the day or the hour. There's no way to calculate the day or the hour. And Jesus said the day or the hour. You won't know the day or the hour because only the Father does. And we're going to go through the wedding thing here in a minute, and you're going to see you're going to see why it was all laid out in the in the Jewish wedding of when they were supposed to be there. But I say all this to 24:15. Because there's something else creeping in. There's something else creeping in that I want you to know about. And it's called amillennium or postmillennialism. And, and I want you to understand that. They believe that the rapture already happened. They believe that the rapture happened. And I, and I don't quite understand how they do that. But they believe the rapture already happened. And that we're actually in the, in the thousand year reign of Christ. And some of them will say... The amillennials will say, well, it's, it's the thousand years just means a long time. It doesn't actually mean a, a physical thousand years. And so we're in that right now. That's what they believe. We're in the millennium, the rule of, uh, of Christ on earth. And we as the body of Christ are supposed to rise up and take control of the earth. We're supposed to be the presidents. We're supposed to be the vice presidents. We're supposed to be the, the CEOs of companies. And the Christians are supposed to be rising up and doing this. Um, that's amillennium. Postmillennium takes the same idea, except for they said the thousand years really ended in a thousand years, and we're in the postmillennium period right now. Okay? And the reason I bring that up is because I haven't talked about that scenario. And last week we had visitors that were that were able, well, they couldn't decide whether they were amillennials or postmillennials, but they were one of the two. And um, and the the problem with that is is it's rising up in the church. There's some large there's some large ministries, video TV ministries that support this, and, it, and I, I don't want to tell you their names because I don't want to set things in your head. But they're they're big they're big uh, ministries today, and they're prosperity ministries, and they believe that we're in the the millennium where man is to rule and we're to take back our place, and we're supposed to be leaders, and we're supposed to be financially taking over the the world, and the Christians should be running. And then when Christ finds that the church is ready, that we have taken rule of the earth back, then he'll return for his bride when we've taken the rule of the earth back. And that's amillennium and postmillennium. And the problem with that is, is that, that it began with Catholicism. The, the Catholics are the ones that initially, before the thousand years, before year 1000, they developed amillennialism as as a way to say, we're supposed to come in and take control of the earth. And that fit well with Rome and Constantine and, and him consuming the earth in power and they're going all over the world. We're supposed to take it back. That's our job as Christians. That's why we have the Crusades. That's why we have all these, we have all these Roman soldiers going and taking control of all these nations around the earth because 
Christians are supposed to take control of the earth. And that was amillennialism. But then when the thousand years came, then they, then they had a problem. Either the thousand years wasn't a true thousand years, or they came up with postmillennialism. Now, a common error that's always made because Jesus said this. Jesus said, you'll know when it's going to begin because there's going to be an abomination of desolation. And that's it's spoken of in Daniel. It speaks of the Antichrist coming and putting, uh, uh, offering some kind of disgraceful offering on the altar. And the amillennialists and, and postmillennialists would say that this is <clears throat> that this took place with a fellow uh, by by a Roman Caesar uh, um, Epiphanes. What's his first name? I just went blank. Um, does anybody remember his first name? Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes, they said that took place, that already took place. So that was done. That was a done deal. Antiochus of Epiphanes was a Roman Caesar, and he took the he took a pig and he offered it on the altar to disgrace, to disgrace the Jews. And so it's, it's already done. It's already done. But there's, see, there's one deep fallacy in what they said. Jesus said this about 33 by our calendars today, it would be about 33, 32 um, A.D., after his birth, right? And um, 32, about the year 32 A.D., Jesus said this. The problem is, is the ruler, uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, actually ruled and did that offering of the pig on the altar in the Jewish temple in 167 B.C. So it was actually 200 years before Jesus ever made this prophecy. So Jesus would have had to make the prophecy in reverse, in rears, because it was it was 200 years before he said this to his to his people. So, but they said, well, it's already happened. Well, it's it's nice. It's a nice glib statement to say that, and and that's kind of been a test. Is when did it happen? Well, it happened 200 years before Jesus said this. So Jesus couldn't be prophesying of something that already took place. That was not his intent. He was saying, "Here's how you'll know it's going to happen." So in order for this to happen, there doesn't have to be another temple. A lot of people like to say there'll be another temple. It doesn't have to be a temple. It never says that in the Bible. But there does have to be an altar, and there's got to be the sacrifices have to be restored in Jerusalem. So in order to do that, we we have to have we have to have a Jerusalem where they can once again put an altar up on the they can once again put an altar up on on the, the Temple Mount, and a lot of people say, well, they can't put that on they can't put the altar on the Temple Mount because the the Dome of the Rock is built there on the Temple Mount. But but in the 1930s, as recorded by Archeo Ar Biblical Archaeology magazine in the 19 80s, they, they did an article on this in the 1980s, where the where the temple of the Dome of the Rock is is not the where the altar of of, uh, of the temple was. The altar of the temple was actually about 300 meters from there at what's what's called the the Dome of the Tablets, which is where the the Ark sat and the tablets. The, and, and there's a little cupola there. It's still there. It's never been torn down at all. It's taken place. The little cupola is still there, and it's about 300 feet, 300 meters, excuse me, away from uh, about 1,500 feet, 300 yards, 300 yards, about 900 feet away from uh, away from the Dome of the Rock. So it's very possible, it's very possible that an altar could be set up there very quickly, and the animal sacrifices could begin again. The Jewish people, they're prepared to do this. They're they're breeding the, the red heifer, which would be the first one that has to be offered there. And it's all it's all in it's all in place. Things that were never in place forty or fifty years ago, hundred years ago. This none of this was in place. And and it's all beginning the, the place is beginning. Now a lot of people, well, you gotta rebuild the 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 temple in order to this happen. The temple doesn't have to be rebuilt, just the altar of sacrifice has to be rebuilt. And so um, then the Antichrist would become angry and he would put a pig on that altar instead and we'd know that the, the Great Tribulation has begun in the three and a half mid period of the Tribulation. And I want to talk of this a little bit. Um, I don't want to support any particular uh, uh, 
uh, any in particular. Our denomination uh, is primarily uh, the wording is such that it's uh, the, 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 the typical belief within the Assemblies of God, and I call it typical belief in the Assemblies of God, is pre-tribulation that was started primarily by a guy named Darby in the late 1800s and, and brought to the United States by a guy named Schofield uh, in the early 1900s. And, um, and we pretty much embraced that. But our actual 16 tenets of faith, we just installed some new people, new members, the actual 16 tenets of faith doesn't actually say that. That's something that's picked up over time, but it doesn't actually say that. It says that two things that we believe in the imminent return of Christ, that means he can come back at any time. So, and that's possible. The seven-year contract could start, the 70th week could start at any time. And, and the church the church would be, uh, would be taken out at any time. And then we believe in the blessed hope, and that's that Christ is going to come take the church out. And what that does is it kind of eliminates the post-trip because then our blessed hope is that we don't go through, that Christ comes back for us, and we don't go through the wrath of God. The key is, is where does it start? Where does the 70th week start? Where does tribulation start? So, so we don't actually uh, specifically define that, but most AG pastors and most AG People would say that we're pre-trib, and that's. But our our 16 tenets of faith doesn't hold us to that specifically. And if you went to the average assembly guy pastor, they'd say, "Oh yeah, we're pre-trib. How can you say we're not pre-trib because our 16 tenets of faith say that?" But they don't say that. They said that we believe in the imminent return, imminent return. And if you would read the, if you would read all the debates, and, I, and this is what I do. You don't have to do this, but if you read all the debates of the different factions and, and how they debate each other about this, there's been, historically, there's been a whole group of people that tend to think that, that the, 70th, the whole 70th week isn't all tribulation. It isn't a seven-year tribulation. And um, and that the imminent return of Christ can come at any time, no doubt about that. And our blessed hope is that we don't go through the wrath. The question is, is how do you define the wrath and how do you define uh, where the seven years or the, the tribulation begins? So, so it's, it's kind of a little open-ended from that aspect. And so I want, I want you guys to, to kind of form your own thoughts as we go through this. Um, and I know some pastors would get up here and say, no, this is what it's going to be. I'm your leader and you're going to think like this. I, I, I don't work like that. I don't work like that. I believe that the scriptures are written to us individually. God is not a respecter of person. And he wants an intimate relationship with you. And he's going to tell you when the bride's coming back. He's going to tell you because it's the Father that decides when the bride comes back. And the bridegroom comes back and meets the bride. So, so, um, but I'll throw this little thought out, which is kind of an interesting thought. And I'm not, again, I'm not supporting any, but I want you to think of this. I want you to think of this. If you've studied Revelation at all, if you've studied Daniel at all, if you've, if you've studied the return at all, and we're encouraged to do that. It said those who study that will be blessed. We're to do that because just as Christ wanted the, the, the Jews to know when he was returning, he wants to know, he wants us to know as the bride to, to know approximately when he's going to return. We don't know the day of the hour, but we should know the seasons. We should know what's going on. And it's very apparent. It's very apparent because the seasons went like this. And I know some of you are going to have to leave in a minute. It's very sad. But, but the seasons went something like this, is that... that um, Christ's birth came, and uh, and he actually came in spring. It was the Romans that decided to do it in December because of their holidays that already existed when Constantine established Christianity, but in in the Roman Empire. But he was born when he was supposed to be born, and then the the, the Passover was supposed to happen. The Passover happened, and then the Pentecost was supposed to happen, and those were all those were all spring pre-summer. I'll call them pre-summer festivals. And they were all, they were all uh, uh, celebrated on a regular basis because God knew if he gave us party time to follow when he's coming, we'd follow when he was coming. He understands us. He knows us. He created us. And so we follow the party times, right? So the next party, he said, would be in the fall. And the next party is the, is the, is the Festival of Tabernacles. And that's when the harvest comes. <coughs> and so we're going to be 
we're, we're going to be working towards the fall, and the great harvest is, the harvest is bountiful. He, Jesus talked about the workers are few, the harvest is bountiful. There's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a great bunch, a whole bunch of people get saved in the fall. But the fall hasn't come yet. I know that we have a fall in our calendar, but God said the seasons wouldn't pass away, and planting and sow, sowing and reaping would not pass away. He said that in Genesis, until the end comes. And, and we're still doing that. I said this to my grandkids the other day. I said, you know, I said, you were a seed. You were a seed once, sowing and reaping. You were a seed once. They said, what? I said, yeah, you were a seed. And you were growing in your mommy's tummy, and then you came out, right? And they said, well, yeah. They never thought about it. We are seeds. We're the product of seeds. You don't think of that. You think of seeds being corn out in the ground or wheat out in the ground. You don't think about the fact that we're seeds. We're part of the whole sowing and reaping thing. <clears throat> and as a result of it, what you sow in your life, what you sow in your life, you're going to reap. When a husband and a wife come together and, and they sow together, then nine months later, they reap a baby if everything worked right. And they reap another child, and another child, and another child, and another child. And fortunately, mothers are happy that we are not like puppies where you have nine at a time or something. But, but that, that's, how it, that's how it works. And so that sowing and reaping is going on, but there's going to be a great harvest, and that great harvest is going to come in the fall, and we're in the summer now. And Christ prophesied it all. He said, look at the fig tree, and when, it, you know, when, the, when the leaf starts to come, the fruit starts to come, then you know it's time for him to return. And so, and, and of course, Israel is likened to the fig tree is finally blooming again because he cursed it because he did, they didn't accept him when he came. He cursed the fig tree and it, because it, was, it had all the leaves but no fruit. It had all the symbols, but it didn't have any true fruit. There was no fruit. And pray to God that the church isn't like that because of the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit lives within us. The Spirit that lives within us is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, jealous, generosity, fidelity, and self-control. And you have to look and say, is that my life? Is that the fruit that I'm producing in my life? Is my life love? Is there love in my life? Because that's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. Do I have joy or do I, do I you know, some of the Christians just say, oh, you know, joy. We're supposed to have joy, unspeakable joy. We're supposed to have joy no matter our circumstances where I have joy. But, you know, Paul and Peter and John, they're... They celebrated and praised God in prison when they were chained up. And they weren't like our prisons today. I don't even want to describe the kind of prisons they were in. They're filthy, horrible places. And yet they praised God because the Holy Spirit dwelt within them. They had joy. Love, joy, peace. They had peace. Whatever he had, Paul, Paul knew he was going to lose his head. Peter knew he was going to be crucified. John was dumped, according to the Fox Book of Martyrs, John was dipped in, in hot oil several times before he ever wrote Revelation. And he didn't die. And the, the Caesar Rome Nero said, I can't kill him. I can't kill him. Why do you think they sent him off to the Isle of Patmos? They couldn't kill him because his time hadn't come. And, and Jesus had, had prophesied that. And Peter said, how come he gets to get out of it? Well, Peter probably got the better end of the deal of dying and, and suffering in one period of time, not being burned and covered with scars the rest of your life until you finally die. Dipped in boiling oil and not dying. What an incredible thing. What a miraculous thing. But we know that, that, that the Meshach, Abednego, and all those guys, they walk right in the fire. Nothing happened to them. They didn't even smell like uh, smoke when they came out. So, so uh, they, were, they, were, they were at peace during that time. They are at peace, love, joy, peace, patience. Patience, oh, that's a good one. Just drive down the highway and see how much patience you got when the guy pulls out in front of you or slows down or breaks, breaks for a squirrel and about kills your whole family. You know, it, it's saves the squirrel, though. You know, and uh, there was the nicest uh, Mormon family that lived right by us as, as, we were, as our kids were growing up. And, uh, and their son... And sadly enough, he was on his way to Millard North to go to school, and a uh, squirrel ran out in front of him on 144th and Center. And to avoid the squirrel, he went off the road, rolled the car, and killed himself, and and, uh, and injured the other kids in the car to save the squirrel's life. Good kid, nice kid. I don't know if he was saved. I don't know because the family was Mormon. I, I don't know if he had ever been taught to trust in Christ alone. I don't think so. So, so it, it, you know. Are you at, at, do you have peace?
patience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, fidelity, and self-control. So, so anyhow, you have to watch the rest of it on the on the video next week on the internet. But but I wanted you to I wanted you to hear that. Um, those are, the, those are the characteristics that the church should have now. And we're entering into the fall period. The summer is about over. The summer is the time of, of, of patient growth and, and, you know, and things going on. And, and we're in the summer right now. And the summer is coming to an end, though. Because when the fig tree, when the fig tree begins to produce fruit again, and it's not just, uh, it's not just, it's not just leaves. So what does that mean? The fig tree. Well, some people like to say it's it's Israel, you know, taking back the the nation and being and being there. And there's probably some some aspect of truth in there. But for them to truly produce fruit, we have to see a, a big revival of Christianity in Judaism. There's going to have to be a bunch of people that recognize, and what that's recorded by the 144,000. As we study through Revelation, you'll see that when we get there. But what I want to do now is I just want to spend a little time in the Jewish. Uh, wedding, the customs of the Jewish wedding, because I want you to see these things, and uh, then we'll wrap up today. But um, so, uh, if you go after number nine, the great trumpet will gather up for his return. After that, it says Jewish wedding customs and the bride of Messiah. This is written by a Jewish fellow, so I want you to see. Uh, I want you to see what their perspective is on it. So it'll say. Yeshua instead of Jesus and those sorts of things. But there are many customs appointed by God as teaching tools. In a unique way, the Jewish wedding ceremony, as opposed to any other culture's expression, and it's important to know that this is this is a Jewish custom, and it lines up with the Bible, and it lines up with what's going to happen with Christ and, and coming back for the bride. We've just we've studied uh, uh, Matthew, and, and we're moving towards Revelation, but... Um, I want you to see this because I'm going to talk next week about the I'm going to talk next week about the bridesmaids, the the ten virgins, the, the good and the bad, and um, or the foolish and the wise. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that next week, and then we're going we're going back to Revelation. We'll go back to the the appearance of Christ uh, about um, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. We'll go back to the appearance of Christ to John. And uh, we'll talk about how Christ revealed himself. We've gone uh, about halfway through uh, Revelations 1 into about verse 10. And then we'll take off in 11 and 12 and, and see what, how Christ presented himself to John and what that represents. And then we're going to go into the churches and go through each church and see what's happening there. But the Jewish wedding, uh, as opposed to any other culture on earth, is a detailed illustration of the Messiah's relationship to his bride. Now, this is written by the Messianic Jew. So there is a certain level of fruit becoming, uh, is starting to come back onto the fig tree. Um, the Sid Kanuan arrangement, pr the uh, preliminary betrothal, that, that's the covenant that's made. It refers to the first step of the marriage process, the arraignment, the, the arrangements per, uh, preliminary to the legal betrothal. It was a common ancient. Uh, it was common in ancient Israel of the father and the groom to select a bride for his son. And so he, they go around and they look for a bride for his son. That's what God is doing right now. Is he's he's ferret, ferreting out the bride that's going to marry. He's written a new covenant with us. We have a new covenant, a new marriage covenant that, that Jeremiah had prophesied. And, um, and we have that new covenant. And so we're no longer with the old covenant. And uh, a bis biblical analogy uh, is Genesis 24, uh, 1 through 4. Notice in this passage that Abraham makes arrangements for his son Isaac's wedding. While the father usually had the responsibility in Abraham's life, it was not possible. So it was acceptable for the father to delegate the responsibilities by designating a representative called a, a Shad, Shadcan marriage broker or matchmaker. So Abraham picked out his, his closest right-hand guy and sent him to go find a wife for his son. Um, the next phase of this step was the, and, and I may not pronounce these correctly, but the kitbah, and it, it's written in Hebrew, H-B-T-K, and, and, and I do know a little Hebrew, so I could uh, talk about that, but I'm not going to. It was, it was, it still is today, the marriage contract, 
and that includes the provisions and conditions of the pro proposal of marriage, the groom promises to support his wife to be. You know, that's interesting, you know, in so many marriages now, uh, it, it, this is another thing I see is, is oftentimes you'll hear people talking about their fiance and they've got children together with them, they've lived together with them for several years and they've got children with other wives or other women other than their wife, but this is their fiance. That's a nice way to say we're not married, uh, but, uh, but the right thing to do is the, the, the husband says, I'm going to support my wife. Jesus is going to support his wife. His bride. Um, the bride stipulates the contents of the dowry, uh, her financial status, and you know our financial status is broken and poor. There's no, none of us, no, not one, that that is righteous before God apart from Jesus Christ. That's why Christ came down, and the dove came upon him uh, instead of fire, like came upon the church at Acts. The dove came upon Jesus, and uh, when he was baptized. And the reason the dove came upon Jesus when he was baptized is because the dove represented the sacrifice that you couldn't afford anything. You couldn't afford anything. If you went to the, if you went to the Jewish temple and you couldn't afford a goat or a sheep or a lamb and you couldn't bring any of that stuff for your sacrifice, then you just go, you, you, you take a, a net or a big cloth and you throw it over the top of a pigeon or a mourning dove that's around and they're all over the place, aren't they? They're everywhere. And you throw that over them and you, you go grab one and you take that to the priest and he would offer that for your sins because you couldn't afford anything else. So Jesus came for the person that couldn't afford anything else and that was us because we're all sinners. None, of, none are holy. None are, none are pure. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't win our own salvation. So our dowry is Jesus himself. Our dowry is his sacrifice for our sins. Our dowry is our Savior. That's my dowry. That's your dowry if you're a born again Christian. And um, then we, we see this described in Genesis 24, 52, 53 in, in an arranged marriage, and, it, and I won't go into detail on that. The next thing is the mohar or the bridal payment, and this is where it, it shows Isaac, and, and of course he's speaking primarily to Jewish people, this fellow's written this, and so he cites Isaiah and Rebekah and Jacob and his wives, and he talks about, um, he talks about that being uh, a payment. Um, for us, it's Jesus. We're redeemed. We're paid for by by Jesus, and so He's our he, He's our payment. He's made the payment because the groom makes that payment, and um, and we gain the, the we gain that by uh, uh, it's not silver or gold, but by the life of Jesus. In First Peter, it says that. But uh, then th this one is I like the mikvah. Uh, I want you to concentrate on this a little bit because it's, it's really interesting. Although not mentioned in this narrative, to prepare the patrol, it was common for the bride and groom to separate separately take a ritual immersion. The ritual immersion of the mikveh taken from the Hebrew was prior to actually entering the formal betrothal period and was symbolic of the spiritual cleansing. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. We're baptized, right? We're baptized in Christ. It, it's it's a, an outward sign of what uh, of our of our payment and our our betrothal to Jesus, but it's something we're we're cleansed spiritually by going into the into the the waters of baptism, and, and it's done prior to that to the contract being enacted between us. So we're encouraged to be baptized, to be immersed in water. But here's one that you maybe haven't thought about: when Jesus came down. To, to the Jordan River, and John said, oh, I can't even untie the laces on your shoe. And he says, no, you got to do this. you got to do this, because even though Christ was perfect and cleansed and all that, he was going to be the bride, uh, the bridegroom, he was going to be the bridegroom, so he was baptized just as part of the, part of the contract, before the contract was made, before the covenant was sealed, the covenant was sealed at the cross in his resurrection, before the covenant was sealed, he was baptized our groom has been baptized. You see, you see, all this had to happen, and it all just goes click, 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 click. And the reason I tell you this is because it says in the Bible that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as you hear these things, you can be encouraged that our God is following his own program. Our God is following the picture that he's given us in the marriage between a, 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 a woman and a man even before he ever came to do it. Before he ever before he ever sealed the covenant with us, he did what he was supposed to do. John said, 
well, I can't baptize you. No, you got to. You got to because that's how it works. First the bridegroom is baptized, then the bride is baptized. So that all represents, and, and I'm not saying you're not saved if you're not baptized. I'm just saying it's all representative of this marriage between us that we look forward to. And he wants us to look forward to it. He wants us to know he's coming back for us. He wants us to know that he's the groom and he's coming back to rescue his bride from this world. So that we can rule and reign with him on this earth for a thousand years under a perfect system. And then we go on to live with him in a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. Praise God. Praise God. He wants us to know this. That's why he tells us to study this. Why does he tell us to study this? Because you'll be blessed. And why will you be blessed? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And the more faith we have, the more bold we are about, about witnessing uh, uh, of what Jesus has done in our lives and what Jesus wants to do in all these people's lives. We're, we're to be out there doing that. But, but if, we're, if we're scared little Christians, you know, circling the wagons and singing kumbaya, then we're not impacting the world that we're supposed to be impacting. And the reason that is is because we don't know enough word, and we don't know enough word to trust our Father. We don't know these things that I'm, I'm bringing forth to you. We don't know these things about this has all been exemplified before Christ ever came. The examples have all been set in these marriage suppers, and all this has all been done. But what we're doing in the church today, what we're preaching in the pulpit today is, is how to get along with your wife and how to pay your checkbook and, 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 and how to have food, fun, and fellowship together. And, and we're not going to this stuff that's going to build your faith. Be encouraged. Be encouraged, folks. At our Walmart on 180th and Center, there's a guy there named Mike. Uh, Born again, uh, at one time a charismatic Catholic, and now he's, uh, you know, practicing his faith in, in a Protestant environment. But you walk in, he's the greeter, and he'll tell you. I mean, he, he he'll tell you when it was Christmas time. He would he had a little clock that kept track of on his phone. He had a little clock, uh, an app that kept track of how many days it was till Christmas. And you'd walk in the in in there, and and he'd look at his little thing, and he says. It's uh, so many minutes, so many days, so many hours, so many minutes, so many seconds until our Savior was born. I mean, he's saying that in Walmart. Everybody comes in, gets to hear that. He says, Christmas is already here. This is how long until our Savior is born. And then we went in the other day to get some stuff for the Valentine's party. And there was Mike. And he right away, he recognized me. I'd give him my card before. He says, oh, hi, Pastor. And, and he starts in with, oh, do you know how to witness the Catholics? Do you know that they worship to Mary and all this? And, you know how to get that, you know, and he quotes scriptures about how Mary uh, worshipped her Savior, and she, how she needed a Savior, and that she wasn't a divine being, and, and all that. And he's just going into it, and everybody's walking by looking at it, and he's just preaching away. He's the greeter of Walmart. He's been paid by Walmart to preach to the people that walk in the door. So praise God. Pray for his covering. They be covered and surrounded with guardian angels, and the enemy cannot come, cannot come upon Mike, because I know there's some people might wanna, that might want to... Uh, complain about that, but I think it's great. But he's bold in his faith. He's bold in his faith. And you know what's interesting about Mike? If Walmart releases him or tells him to stop doing that, he'll go someplace else and do that because you know what? That's his character now. That's who he is. That's his makeup. That's what runs in his blood veins now is to, is to speak of Jesus Christ. So anyhow, the baptism, I mean, it's right there. It's right there. Jesus was baptized so he could initiate the covenant payment. That he could start the whole thing. He could pay for us. Illustrating the Messiah's bride that starts with the father selecting the bride for his son. As we are selected by the father to be his beloved son, loving, precious bride. And what does he say in the Bible? He says, he says, God draws you. God draws you to him. See, the father is selecting the bride. He looks down and he says, you know, I'm looking for a bride for my son, you know. I'm thinking that Sherry is going to be all right. I want, I want her to, so I'm going to go to her and I'm going to, I'm, my Holy Spirit's going to go to her and he's going to lure her. He's going to, he's going to lure her into, and she's still free to decide. At this point, the girl's still free to decide, but, but I, I want, I want Sherry. I want Sherry to come. I want Lynn to come. I want Mary and Joe to come. You know, I want Christelle to come. I, you know, and, and we don't think of it all the time, but, but we're part of the bride too, guys. We're part of the bride too. 
And just as he wants these ladies, he wants Jared, he wants Chuck, he wants Kevin, he wants Bruce, he wants Mike, he wants me. He wants us in that. He wants us in that, in the body of the bride. He wants us there. He's looking forward to us being in that relationship with him. So he's looking for us. And then, you know, it's interesting. It says the bride promises, the groom promises to love and care for his bride, which Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. For God so loved the world, he gave him only the other son. He said, I didn't come into the world, condemn the world. I came into the world to save the world. And the bride promises to, to pay her dowry, the financial status, that it yield with life and keep herself for him. That's our part. And he paid the price. He gave us, he gave us the dowry to pay. The Mohar is, is illustrated by our relationship to Yeshua, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. We have been redeemed with a price. We are also told that our bride's price is not just silver and gold, but it's his own life, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Both the bride and groom have undergone the waters of mikvah immersion. Jesus did it. We did it. Um, hopefully everybody here has done that. Uh, again, it's not what saves you. But it's it's an illustration of that. It's an evidence outside evidence of what's what's taken place inside you. And I believe this. I believe that Christ's life was important enough that He do it. Then it's important that we do it. So it, it's uh, again, it's not a deal breaker, but it is something that I know there's some denominations that make it a deal breaker. But then I'm sad for the people that gave their life to Christ in the in the falling of the towers on 9/11. Because if they couldn't find a drinking fountain or something to get you know, maybe the water hoses from the firemen. I, I don't know, but I, I think it's very sad that some religions teach that, that you have to be baptized, because then what about the person that gives his life? And it says in Jude, some people just snatch out of the fire, right? So, um, so the object is get out of the fire, not necessarily get baptized. But, and then oftentimes the word baptism in the Holy Spirit, there's over 300, there's over 300 words that we translate by, bap, baptize. 300 words that are either Greek or Aramaic in the New Testament, and, um, and 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 they're different words. And oftentimes, emerged means that you're just emerged, in, you know, merged in that relationship. I'm just really emerged and immersed in that relationship with Jesus Christ. So it doesn't necessarily have to be water, but but it's nice that it's that way. Um, you're the you're a, you're a sin or betrothal. Um, I can't pronounce that word, but it means betrothal. Betrothal, uh, betrothal. Uh, the period called this is sanctification time set aside, and it, it, it's it's really the part that we're in right now. It's uh, it's it's a time that we're it, it's a time that we're uh, we're, we're really uh, we've been chosen, and I, I like that. I remember the Toy Story. If you guys ever saw the movie Toy Story, where the little guys are in the the the, the clock comes down. You're chosen. You know, we've been chosen. The clock came down and got us. Christ put the dollar in and pulled us out. But we've been chosen. And um, and during that time that we, we try and live a life with the help of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of God's Word, uh, we, we begin to live a life that, that is becoming to the bride of the Creator of the universe, right? And uh, and that's, that's what we're working on now in our day-to-day -day lives. And... Um, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of stop there. Um, there's so much more that I could go. I wanted to really get across the idea of the immersion that he did, and the Father being the one that chooses us and all that. And I'm gonna stop here for a second because I want to describe something, and, and I related this on Tuesday night. But our son uh, in California just got engaged, right? And. Um, and there's a token in the marriage, the Jewish wedding. There's a token given. There's a token from the bridegroom to the bride. Because he's going to go away for a year and build the house. Just like Jesus said, I'm, build, I'm, build, I'm going away to build a place. Those guys all knew what he was talking about. They knew exactly what he was talking about. When he said, I go away to build. He knew that he was coming back. But if he's coming back, there, there's, there's, some, there's some indicator or some promise that was given. Something of great value that the that the groom had, he would give her, the bride, something of great value to ensure she knew that he was coming back for her. 
And in the, in, in the New Testament, it says that that was, that was the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit has been given to us as that guarantee, that warranty that Jesus is coming back for us. And that Holy Spirit is living within us and it's coming back for us. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm here to give glory to Christ. Christ can said, I'm here to give glory to the Father. The Holy Spirit says, I'm here so that through your life I can give glory to God. And the promise is the Holy Spirit is living within us. Now, some people have a form of godliness, but deny the power of the dunamis thereof. But Jesus says, wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, those guys were already born again because he had breathed. He said, I breathe the Spirit upon you. They were already born again back in, 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 in the Gospels. But he said, don't do anything until Acts 2. He said, don't, <coughs> don't do anything until Pentecost comes. And a lot of people say, oh, they were in the upper room praying forever, and they didn't know what was going to happen. Well, they knew exactly what was going to happen. <coughs> they knew that the promise was going to come on Pentecost. They knew it was going to come. They knew what day was going to happen. And the promise came, and their promise came as tons of fire, not a dove, but fire, because fire in the desert, in, in, in Gettys and stuff like that, boy, fire starts, it spreads like crazy. And that's what the intent of Christ was, for his bride to go forth and just burn the earth, in a sense, to, to take forth the flames, the power of God. I came to baptize in repentance in the water, is what John said, but he who comes after me baptizes in the Holy Spirit and in power. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us to go forth and proclaim the glory of our King. Now, here, my son just gave his, his fiance a wedding ring. And, and in my sense of things, you understand that he's a rocket scientist and she's, she's an executive for CBS. Um, they spent a lot more on that ring than I would ever spend on a ring. But this ring, he sent us a picture of it. It's gigantic. But he sent us this picture. You know what that is? That's a representation of his love and his intent to marry her. She could take that ring and she can go to work and she did and she can show it to people and, and people would say, oh my gosh, this guy really likes you, doesn't he? This is, this is incredible. This guy is really in love with you. Now, remember, my wife and I have been married for 50 years and I gave her a ring from Sears and Roebuck on my revolving charge card when there were American Express and Visa and all those. There was only Sears and Roebuck and we went to Sears and Roebuck and bought, bought it for $145. She still wears it. But for us, that was a big thing. She could go show everybody, he's, he's going to marry me. Well, my son just bought this big ring for her. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Because the Holy Spirit's in us. The Holy Spirit is in us to bring glory to God. To bring glory to Jesus Christ, our bridegroom. When that lady, our, our, our soon-to-be daughter-in-law, takes that ring and shows people at work, that's a symbol of the greatness of the man that has promised to marry her. It's a symbol of, the, of, the, of his large love for her, that he would make this kind of a promise with that size of a ring and with that kind of a commitment. They actually flew to Chile and, they, and he asked her on a mountaintop on an island outside the, the Pacific Ocean in Chile. But, um, but it, it, it's, that's how large our love is. And see, the Holy Spirit is in us just, just, just to, demonstrate, uh, to demonstrate the greatness of God's love for us, the greatness of Christ's love for us. He says, I'm going to put the Holy Spirit in you. And isn't it a shame that by and large the church, in America at least, the evangelical church, wants, wants a form of godliness but denies the power of they're denying the ring. They're not showing off the ring. They're not showing off the power of God living in me. The, the love and the joy and the peace and the patience. You know, she's all excited. They're both, they're both never been married before. He's 42, she's 36 or 37. Neither one of them ever been married or in a, in a, in a long-term relationship at all, either one of them. And, and, and she's excited. He's going to marry her. And she's got proof... Now, she doesn't want to draw attention to the ring. She wants the ring to draw attention to her betrothed, right? Some of these people have never met her, but they see the ring and whoa, he really likes you, doesn't he, honey? You know, and it, it's so, you, you have to understand, and they're planning where it's going to be, and it's going to be on a mountainside that overlooks the ocean and, and all this kind of stuff, and uh, it, it's incredible, the plans that they're making. Uh, you know, 
they've she's hired Hollywood arrangers that arrange for concerts and all that stuff to arrange their marriage and all this. You know, just beyond my understanding or thinking completely. But it's going to be a magnificent thing that's going to happen. And it's going to be incredible. But you know what's going to happen for us? Jesus is coming for us. Jesus is coming for us. And it's not going to be some sneak away at midnight kind of thing. It's going to be at night. Usually it's at night. And I'll talk about that when I talk about the bridesmaids and, and the, the ten virgins. It's usually at night. You know why it was usually at night? Because it was very, very hot during the day. And, and the thing that's going to happen is after the bridegroom comes for the bride, they consummate their marriage. And they like to do, to do that in the early morning. They did that in the early morning when it was still cool. Because you know what happens? And, and this is going to totally embarrass you. The whole city, all the family members, they're standing there waiting. They're, they're in a curtained area. And they go in and have their, their relationship. And everybody's standing out there waiting for it to finish. You, you got your whole wedding party waiting for the big wedding supper of the Lamb, right? And, and everybody is there to witness the, the marriage. And the marriage is consummated. And um, it's interesting stuff. I won't go into too much detail today. But my point is, is what's, what, are you, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life in Jesus Christ? What, what indicator of your life? What indicator of your life? Where's the symbol of your life? What, what do you look like to the world? Now, you can get, you can get too crazy and you can make it all about the ring. And some, and some Pentecostal denominations have done that. Unfortunately, some of the Assembly God churches have done that. Let's make it all about the ring. Do you speak in tongues? Do you have you know, prophecy? Do you dance in the aisles? Do you wave your hands? Do you all this stuff? And I believe in all of that. As long as it brings glory to Christ. But if it's, but if it's just about that, the Holy Spirit didn't come to do just that. You can be like the evangelicals. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, but you've never accepted the power of the Holy Spirit, so you don't have the power. So, so you don't wear the ring so much. You know, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. You know, I'm not, I'm not comfortable. We had a couple call and say, "Oh, we want to come to your church." I said, "Well, you know, we speak in tongues." You know, it came up in the conversation. It wasn't the first thing I said, but it came up in the conversation. I, we're spirit filled. We speak in tongues. So my husband doesn't like that. And I knew that they would never come. I knew that they wouldn't come and visit. I said, well, he's welcome to come. Well, I'll explain it to him. We can talk about it. Oh, no, I don't think he likes that. She, and then she said, well, maybe we should come just to learn about it. But they, they haven't. I prayed that they would. I called them back, and they didn't respond. I got their message. They didn't respond. But see, some people don't. They, they're, they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed of their relationship with God, and they hide it. They're afraid they're going to be rejected because of their relationship with God. Some people put too much emphasis on the ring and, and not who gave the ring. The Holy Spirit wants to glorify Jesus Christ in their life. But then there's too many Christians that are born again, spirit filled, have the Holy Spirit and power living in them and and the, the, unintentionally, but they walk around with the frown on their face, sadness, you know, love, love. You know, just, it, it, it's, you know, oh, I'm a Christian, you know. I believe in God and he expects all these things of me. And listen, you know, that, that's just wrong. There should be joy written all over us. When we walk into a room, that there ought to be just, we're the light and shining in the darkness. We ought to just light up the room. People ought to just say, whoa, you know, they're just here. I stopped at the bank the other day to deposit some of the church's checks and, and uh, that people had given us for the, the, the thing. And, um, and I drove up, and, and the guy at the at the bank, and I go to several different banks, but I make it a point that people know who I am and who my Savior is. And I drive up. My grandkids are in the car with me, and I drive up, and, and Luke's in there. I said, hi, Luke. He said, hi, Jim. You know, through the window, through the speaker. I'm, not, I'm driving in the drive-thru. My, grand, my granddaughter said, why is every place we go, everybody knows you? You know, we went to Baker's after that, and the guy at Baker's, hi, Chris, hi, Jim. She said, not everybody knows us. Not everybody knows our mom and dad. And I said, no, they should, though. They should know because they know who I am and what I represent. 
They know that Jesus is my Savior, and I'm the avenue for them to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'm one of the many avenues, but I'm, I'm an avenue for that. But if I mope around, and, and people, and, 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 she's, and my granddaughter said, well, they just smile. She's about 13, 14. You know, she just turned 15. And she's sitting in the pastor's side where he wasn't with us. And, and she said, he just smiled at you. He, he went from, he wasn't smiling. And then he, he was talking to the customers. And when he saw you, he just smiled. That's, that's the impact we should have. But if we come moping around all the time, if we, and it's not me. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit in me. It's not the ring, right? It's not the ring. It's the joy that I have because I have the ring. Thank you. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be that, that, that I remember Bruce told me he walked here from, from Plattsmouth. And, and I remember we got a ram's horn back there. I remember I, I'd take that ram's horn and I'd go up and down Highway 75 and blow the ram's horn throughout the week to call in all the people. You know, it's time for, it's time for the wedding. It's time for war. It's time for a lot of things. And we had some high school kids coming to school, church here. Now they've grown up and gone off to college and had jobs. But they, uh, one of them came in and says, oh, guy, a friend of mine saw you, Pastor. You're walking down the, down the road. He said you had a great big boa snake on your arm. Well, it's the great big ram's horn. I had to hold it like that. He said, he said he's afraid you guys are the, the snake guys. You know? <laughs> he said you had a great big boa constrictor around your arm. But uh, you buy, you, the he and I used to go down and walk through Main Street and Plaza with and blow the horn. And somebody said, well, that's embarrassing, Pastor. That's, you know, what kind of a, what kind of a crazy thing is. He and I were going door-to-door -door evangelism, and we, we came upon the Presbyterian pastor that, here in town. We came up, upon his house. He lives over, uh, what's that, Bay thing over there? But um, he, we came to his house, and, and he hadn't been at the meetings, the pastoral meetings for a while. I said, where have you been? And he said, he said, well, I've been sick. I, I think I have cancer. And, and I said, well, oh, my gosh. And, and Brad and I were there. And I said, let's anoint him with oil and pray for him right now. And he looks around. And he, oh, my gosh. He said, not out here. He says, uh, you, you guys just pray for me when you get, you just pray for me when you, you, you're walking and you're thinking about me when you're going house to house. Just, just, just pray for me. Don't, don't do it here. He, I mean, he just panicked. He just panicked. The enemy had condemned him with this disease. And his pride was more important to him and how people would see him. He was on sabbatical. He wasn't preaching at the time. He didn't want this to get back to his congregation, that he was letting people pray for him and anoint him with oil right in his driveway. It was a nice spring day. If you could have just seen the panic, I mean, he just absolutely panicked. And he's a pastor. He's about my age. He panicked that somebody was going to pray for him in public because that might get back. See, show off the ring. Show off the ring. I'm engaged to be married to the creator of the universe. How exciting could that be? How exciting could that be? I mean, my gosh. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He's got everything he wants to give. I'm set. This is cool. But let that be a reality in you. But, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. As you hear the Word of God, as you let that Word get inside you, then you change. It's not about your circumstances. It's not about your situation. I couldn't afford the ring they bought. I couldn't afford the wedding venue. I didn't even know what that word meant a couple weeks ago. I couldn't afford the wedding venue they've got. But I'm not going to waller because I can't afford what somebody else can. I'm going to say, this is where I am. This is today. I don't know if I have tomorrow. But this is the day, and I'm going to rejoice in it. Isn't that the song? This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. And I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I know you're saying, man, you can't even carry two in a bucket. But, but I, want you to, I want you to think about this. This is about the joy. This is about the joy. And the world is, the world is a mess. They're sad. They're protesting. They're boycotting. They're rioting. They're doing all this crud. We should be the light. We should be the joy. 
We should be that representation for them. Yet we cannot do it on our own. See, my my son's fiance could had taken that ring off and said, Oh, he's really a good guy, he's great, and you know, he asked me to marry him. And, and, and it would have some meaning. It would have some meaning. But when she puts that ring on, and she says, look at how much he loves me. This is a symbol of his love for me. That's, that's where we are right now. We're in that process. We're waiting for our, our groom to come back and get us. When the father says, the bride's ready, the house is ready, and we're, we're going to go back and get her now. We're going to go get her now, and we're going to have us a wedding. That's, what, that's what's happening. And you're either wearing the ring, or you're hiding the ring, or you don't have the ring at all. But if you got the ring, it's more glorious than any fancy ring that he, my son bought his fiance. It's not, it's not that. This is something that we've got the Holy Spirit living within us, not just in glory, but in power to bring glory to the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I want you to concentrate on that. I want you to, I want you to think about that. I give you that. I give you that not to say, oh, I've got something that you don't have. I give you that to say that you have something you may not be displaying. That you've got something that's promised to you that's great and mighty and incredible. And we got to show it off. we got to show it off. Father, I praise you and I thank you and I give you the glory. For you're worthy above all else. You're worthy above all else. I ask you, Father God, to impart the promise of your word. You say your word will not fall void, but it will go forth to do what's intended to do. I pray that your word will come from us to the world, Father God. Come from us as a demonstration of your love to the world. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and give you the praise. And let everybody know of who dwells within us and the promise that he's given us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's do a praise song and then we'll be out of here.